Hello and welcome to episode number two of the What, So What, Now What Data and Tech podcast. Today is the 30th of January and I'm joined by my co-host Ravi. Hello, good morning. Good morning for me at least. <laughs> Where are you today? So today I'm on the East Coast, so this is fairly early for me, so five hours ahead of the UK, so it's about 6.30 my time. Uh, so I'm guessing about 11.30 your time? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Cool, yeah. No, so I'm, I'm across for just this week um, and up early to record a nice, fresh new pod. <laughs> Good stuff. It's been a little bit of a break since our last podcast. I think uh, we're going on a, a two and a half week um, schedule here. So um, we're going to get this out as soon as we can. And this yeah. time around, it's going to be available on iTunes as well. So hey, hey. if you listen to iTunes... Um, you'll be able to find this podcast there, as well as SoundCloud and any other podcast app that uses those platforms. Now, we'll try and get it on more platforms soon, and our website should also be live very soon. So uh, we'll have a home for the podcasts. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Hat tips to, for you to getting all that sorted as well. But I, I will say we're still on our cadence for two two podcasts a month, so okay. uh, just about just about we're still on that cadence so it works quite nicely okay so there you go ravi 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 pretty much uh highlighted our routine <laughs> uh two podcasts a month and um, that's that's what we're going for so what are we talking about today team what's our what's our topic so this is actually our original uh, first episode <laughs> yeah. that we did before but didn't uh, record uh continuing from the last show we're talking about discovery and learning um uh, it's based off a, a, a blog post i wrote um, in August of last year, so this is quite some time ago, but uh, I think we're going to expand a bit on it today. Absolutely, yeah. So I, I think that it's it's a really important topic, and we had definitely had a really good discussion last time, or the first time we talked about this. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll just kick off with the what. So just a reminder for the listeners, the structure of the podcast, of course, goes what, and then we talk about the so what, and then the now what. Uh, so Tim, tell tell me about what what you mean when you talk about sort of the learning versus discovering and teaching. So what what sort of what is your actual base for this topic? So the the the, the thought process for this started actually when I discovered some of my first uh, Tableau workbooks, um, and essentially I was trying to understand you know what's my journey up until this point been like and how normal or abnormal has it been, um, and. Another question I often get asked was, you know, how do you learn Tableau? How, like some people, I, I don't like this question when people ask it, but they always ask, how can I um, get as comfortable as you or as confident as you in a particular thing? And it's kind of like an awkward question to ask because, you know, you put a very unique amount of time and energy into something. Mm -hmm. So when someone's essentially asking you to tell you that to tell tell them your secrets it's kind of like i don't know i would i feel uncomfortable sharing that because it's sort of my own unique thing yeah so it's 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 always like a unique sort of approach right you're fairly idiosyncratic in the way you approach something like um you know like 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 learning because it's unique to that individual person um so it's 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 definitely harder to say to someone well i just did this 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 and almost list because i don't think anyone goes about learning in that way but sorry yeah continue exactly exactly and so what i what i tried to do is i i tried to i tried to sort of highlight the biggest pitfall i often see which is too much emphasis on learning in the traditional sense um and i i guess i guess i have to be careful with the words i use today but um learning and discovery i'm going to turn them as different things but they're all part of a learning process okay and so mm -hmm. the way I sort of differentiated it was that, you know, you can go down the traditional route where you take some courses, you go online, you attend, um, you know, a classroom session, you go by the book, you buy some textbooks. And there's some great books out there, um, not just, you know, related to Tableau, related to data in general. Um, and you can mm -hmm. sort of assimilate that and, and look at some of the skills that they teach you. But then there's another pa aspect to it, which which I sort of believe quite firmly in that, Unless you actually put a little bit of energy and time yourself into trying these things, sort of applying these techniques and discovering how those techniques actually come about, discovering the journey required to get to those steps, it's you sort of miss out on a fundamental aspect of sort of the, the holistic nature of the information you need to sort of take in because... A lot of what you do isn't just about, you know, building the viz or, you know, learning this particular technique to handle data. It's actually also about 
being able to look ahead and look back and see what steps do I need to take in order for this to be even feasible. And so mm. what I tried to do in the blog post is just basically list out a couple of techniques I encourage people to sort of immerse themselves in the community, be exposed to things they're not often exposed to. Um, I always tend to tell people that business problems are the worst kind of problems to solve because they're normally <laughs> boring, they're not dynamic, the situation's always really luck luckluster um, because people have higher aspirations than uh, you know the you know the data actually allows them to achieve so i always i always mm -hmm. tell people to you know step out of the business problems and go go pick another domain um there's lots of data sets on makeover monday um there are lots of weekly challenges out there or pick a subject that you're passionate about maybe it's yourself and you know i do quantified self data or maybe it's running for example mm -hmm. take that data and actually work with that data, understand what it takes to transform that data, change the data, pivot that data, do all those different things, because then you're starting to learn how those things sort of manifest. And by doing that, you discover more about what's capable, um, not just with Tableau, I guess, but with a lot of things, you know, you sort of learn by doing and by doing that, you develop a much richer, nuanced sort of understanding of a topic that goes beyond just the technical skill required for example on how to build a waterfall chart you know i guess my my sort of take on that is it really depends on where you started that foundational layer right so for for me at least my journey to using tablet is completely different from yours right so of yeah. as i went as i sort of discovered it through the football analysis i was doing so soccer for our american listeners um that that sort of it i started with excel and then i wanted to build something cooler like uh, the stuff that people on twitter were doing with around r and python but i didn't have the knowledge to know where to start with code so i found this blog by a guy called neil charles who who basically wrote a blog about you know how to do football analysis using tablet and that's sort of where my the series of accidents that led to me joining the data school happened uh compared to yourself and your journey is more i guess self-directed would you say Yes. So I guess the context I have is I, I, I learned mostly Tableau. Tableau was the first data tool that I use. And I want to be mm -hmm. careful not just to talk about Tableau, but Tableau was the first data tool I use. And then Alteryx was, was, came after very quick, quickly after. So there was almost a three month gap between me using those two things for the first time. However, I'd been exposed to Tableau previously um, at university, so I, I had seen the software, but I never knew it was actually Tableau. And so when I realized that this was actually a tool that you could use, I was sort of driven by that. And you know, I, I got the opportunity to work at the information lab um, uh, through this. So essentially, I, I learned Tableau by essentially being put in front of problems and then solving those problems one at a time. Uh, there wasn't like a curriculum or, or structure. I just sort of right. took each problem as they came and I solved them uh, or I asked for help. And um, obviously, team at Information Lab was great. So I, I got that support. So I, I guess my that, that's, that almost sounds like the um, sort of my experience with some clients where they, they're using it in anger. So that instead of, so I, I always think of it Tableau as a strange, in a strange way because of that foundational curriculum structured learning that we do have in the four months of the data school. Right. And the fact that you are taught what the green and blue means at a very early stage um, in, this, in this sort of tool. But I guess my main overarching point is uh, unless you have that sort of structured curriculum learning, uh, the way you'd approach it, in my opinion, um, say, for example, if I'm trying to learn Python is by taking a, a sort of endpoint. Right. So taking an endpoint and then working towards that rather than, as you say, working towards just solving one single problem in a vacuum, um, working yeah. to almost build out from the ground up to get to a certain stage. But I guess it depends. This is where, this is where we get into what is discovery versus what is um, sort of a structured <laughs> learning, right? Like, I, th I feel like there's almost a hybrid there. Absolutely. And I guess this takes me back because... Um, Time and time again, um, and, and I guess you see this as well, many consultants will see this. You, when you go into an organization and you're the expert or, or in a particular domain, uh, you're held as the expert, I'll say. Um, I think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what, <laughs> what, what tends to happen is you see people using something and it's abundantly clear to you from the minute you see them just even dragging the mouse to a particular location screen that they're not aware of some other feature. And... Mm -hmm. you know, I get this all the time and it's it's sort of it's sort of really telling because unless you have the fundamentals really sort of well taught 
it's also hard to take part in something like discovery learning because you can almost hit this barrier where like you, you've decided to take on a problem and you're going to try and solve this problem. But because you are still learning, you don't know the scale of the problem. Mm. And as you get into it and you sort of start to dissect it, yes, you're having a valuable learning experience because you're sort of taking these big blocks and making them smaller. But then if you've taken on something too big, then it mm -hmm. can actually kind of put you off. And that's where I think the frustration you're talking about comes in. Because you want to do something really, which you think is simple. You, you don't really appreciate the software for what it's mm -hmm. doing, right? You just kind of have this demanding uh, sort of use of software. Yeah, that's the familiarity, right? So like, for example, you know, the, the one of the most common ones that I'm, I'm sure you've heard as well is, I can do this in Excel, but why can't I do an X? Like, you can't, yeah. I can't do an R, I can't do it in Python. Yeah. Like, well, yeah. that's because Excel works in a fundamentally different way to all of these different tools that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. um and it, it's that familiarity complex right and i think that almost comes back to when you're taught in a structured way that you almost cycle through okay it's not this so it must be this okay it's not that so it must be this so you'd have you almost have a a structure of if it's not this that solves the problem i will try this other thing that i was taught but you, again you, you're um throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks rather than saying wait no let me take a step back and think about the tools i have in front of me and which elements I need in order to solve the problem in front of me at, the, at this point in time. Yeah, totally. I totally, I totally agree. And actually, we're sort of, we're, we're sort of, sort of midway through the, you know, the so what bit. And the important thing mm. here is that I think, I think if you have this context, if you have an understanding that it's, it's just, it's not enough to just essentially, um, you know, learn by the book, but also you have to do a, a mix and a blend of lots of different ways of learning, lots of different ways of immersing yourself mm -hmm. in the topic um, that is suited to you. Because, you know, I'll hold my hand up when I'm learning, when I'm learning JavaScript, for example, uh, the only way I could start with that was to go through a course. Um, and I went mm -hmm. through uh, Treehouse because I've been using Treehouse for years. They're great. And I had to start there because I'm learning something so radically different that just sort of blundering around the internet wouldn't be a good way to start. Like mm -hmm. discovering JavaScript doesn't sound like a catchy phrase either. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not at all. It's a, it's a language. So um, I guess what I'm saying, you know, I guess apply this, apply this way of thinking depending on what you're learning and what suits you. But once you have this sort of good basis of understanding where you feel comfortable to, you know, go a bit further, you can start to sort of, you know, unravel yourself a little bit, let loose and just mm -hmm. explore some of the uh, more sort of nuanced technologies and, 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 and see where you go. Um, the other thing I'll say is it's really easy to learn in isolation and it's actually really hard. And I encourage people to try and do this more to take your learning and immerse yourself around others. So sharing with colleagues going to things like user groups, uh, you know, take part in those sort of public weekly challenges and competitions to build something because those simulate a healthy sort of pressure in you to actually really understand the topic because um, one, of, one of the best things I was ever told um, by a colleague at Information Lab was you don't really understand something until you have to teach someone else. And that, mm -hmm. is, that is the absolute sort of level. And that doesn't mean you know everything about the topic. But at that point, you yourself are comfortable because not only do you understand it, but you're able to articulate it back out to people. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, that that's that's a massive, massive um, message there, right? Because once you have to start teaching it to someone who either knows nothing or knows very little about the topic you're about to explain to them, um, then you actually end up having to start at the basics and unravel your own journey almost um, or unravel yeah. at least the topic itself to say, okay, this is... This is, these are all the different elements and I need to sew this together into a cohesive th thread. I guess it's almost like meta storytelling, right? So if we're, if we're talking about like, yeah. you know, data being the storytelling, like, you know, data without context is nothing, etc. Like this is almost like the meta level of, yeah, but in order to learn that, you have to tell them a story, how to teach, you know, in order to teach that lesson. I guess one of the other things I, I'd like to t touch on is the fact that you can, uh, looking at other tools and methods of, approaching the same data for, and also using that as a cross industry cross not not industry as you've mentioned in the um in the blog but almost cross 
um, discipline, right? So, for example, mm-hmm. I think I, I recall us having a conversation about um, using the photography grids um, in order to actually yes. design a design a, a visualization or infographic in a way that leverages all the knowledge that exists in photography in order to leverage everything that they know about taking a good picture or using u- the use of color. Um, or ev- even like exactly. um, I- I've often looked at storyboarding in comic books in order to structure my own sort of presentation in my head. So how does a comic book leverage, you know, the, the page turn or the reveal or, a, you know, a, a, a entire A4 size spread versus a, a half sized panel, right? So these sort of techniques mm-hmm. that designers are using because uh, then I guess... I guess that the problem is you can, it's easier to find those examples with design, but less so with with the logical approach. You know, like um, the mathematical side. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I guess um, I I guess that's more to do with uh, sort of barriers to entry, right? Maths uh, is, is kind of an intimidating subject to some. Whereas you know, <laughs> design is everyone. Everyone feels at some point they are a designer, right? Everyone, right. you know, you build your first dashboard. You you kind of feel like a designer. You've built something. You've crafted something. But to go deeper into that, design isn't actually just about that. Like mm-hmm. I always, I always get on a high horse when it comes to design because I think people think it's um, an own. It's a purely aesthetic thing, and I fundamentally disagree with that and sort of opinion. When uh, clients talk to me about design, I don't start with colors, layout, uh, or any of that. I actually start with a fundamental question, which is why are we doing what we are about to do? Like, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Yes. Because a design a design sort of way of thinking is to say, I'm a problem solver. I'm not, a, I'm not an aesthetic designer. I'm a problem solver. And the way I put content on a page, the way I lay information out, what colors I use, all those are just tools that serve a purpose. And the purpose is to make it functional. And that is what mm-hmm. design is to me. And I think too many people will build a dashboard, then they'll term the next step they do, which is to make it look good, as in some design steps. You know, let's let's make the design better. I always hear, or let's uh, let's make this look nice. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like flawed because if you're doing it at that point, you've kind of missed the point right at the beginning, which was uh, I, I'd even challenge some people and go, when you're building your data model, you should actually be thinking about design then, because. The, the fields and columns yeah. you put into your data model actually will make a big exp- uh, user experience uh, benefit or you know uh, negative for your users at the very end. How many times do you mm-hmm. craft nasty calculations um, just so you can get like a filter working when if you built that into your data model, the user would have a much faster experience at, at the end. And that's a very simple example. And I can you know I can go on and on and on. There's so many <laughs> similar examples like this. Um, and you have to go right at the beginning. Design isn't about aesthetics. It's about problem solving and making really cohesive experiences. And the tool set mm-hmm. is sometimes the things, that, the way they look. But most of the time, it's purely just making sure you've thought things through. You've, you've, you've logically analyzed what needs to be done. And you're using the full set of capability to do that. So I, I'd almost I'd I'd say yes I I agree with a lot of that but I would challenge that sort of um, that thinking because mainly because of the fact that that almost encourages that pixel perfect perfect for perfection and for me that isn't my my sort of mantra is always iteration and the fact that yes you should start off with a standing start in the way that you describe where you are thinking about the design first yes that's mm-hmm. fantastic but. At each stage, when you reevaluate and you present and you get you crowdsource opinions, you have to get that feedback loop, and you then get the feedback on the design as well. Um, and of course, and that is the stage where you then say, "Yes, we can do that," or "No, that'll require I us to either go back to the data model, or in mm-hmm. order for us to write a nasty calculation based on the timeframes." This this is the the other thing that you know the t- time is the enemy of all design and. Uh, even brevity right like i think it was uh, uh, one of the famous writers maybe hemingway who said i would have written you a a shorter letter if i had more time right because (laughs) it's very easy it's very easy to just get into this habit of just writing and writing in in our case coding and coding or building and building just for the sake of it or getting as much content in there and not just thinking about what elements do i need and taking away that clutter be it image be it design be it colors be it even content even data um, whether that uh, that number that will require a nasty calculation or 
the fact you have to take a step back into the data modeling stage, whether that's, you know, is, is it necessary? Is there a way that we can leverage something else in order to get the same level of information? Absolutely. I, I kind of think that's why my Twitter feed ex- has exploded because people just like now with the extra characters, they're just annihilating the uh, mm. <laughs> the, tw- the, the feed. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, to go back to sort of the learning, learning thing, you know, you're learning from lots of different tools, lots of different perspectives and lots of different angles. It's impossible mm. to learn all these things that, you know, you can't be expected to have, you know, go spend a whole day on typography or a whole day on color theory. You know, you could get a lot. People do like, you know, dissertations and, 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 and whole like sections of their careers just understanding these these principles. But I think what is good is that a lot of these communities, a lot of these sort of parallel disciplines have synthesized the key concepts very, very well. And so I always encourage people, look, just before you choose a color palette, just just go research some color theory and understand what colors actually mean to an individual. You know, Mm -hmm. in the tools we use every day, Tableau have done a really good work on this A lady called Maureen Stone who if you ever get a chance to see her at conference, absolutely go. She taught me so much in terms of little tips and tricks in terms of colour um, and things that Tableau does with colour that you don't even realise unless you, you actually start to interrogate mm-hmm. like the colour values that are coming out. So, you know, just spend some time immersing yourself with those people, not because you want to turn into them, but because you just want to learn from them, see how they see things. Um, yeah. And... I, th- I think the one last one last point on, on on this. I think you also have to make sure that when you use other tools, you don't fall into this overly critical perspective of not understanding the world that people who use that tool are in. I think it's very easy. For example, for I, I see this a lot in the Tableau community. For people, just you know, they've, they've, they love Tableau. They use it very easy, and then in one split second, they're just you know criticizing other tools. A click is a click is often often the common one, right? And what they don't understand mm-hmm. is that that tool is used in a completely different context. Even though <clears> it's a competitor, it doesn't necessarily mean that it, you know people want to use it in the same way. Um, and so you have to appreciate tools and uh, things that you're learning for the context that they're used in, not from the context that you're coming from. Yeah, well, yeah, one hundred percent. I think that 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 sort of understanding of where where that that journey starts and what you're what you're actually using the tool for and the application for it and also you know it's it's like the the power bi is a great example for that because it's it's a very very good reporting tool right it's 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 very slick and it looks nice and it's familiar for a user that's used to the excel world it's it's in in that reporting you know the 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 car with no wheels scenario it looks very nice but um, in terms of doing analysis it can get quite tricky so one thing I will mention actually um, on the Maureen Stone point is Tableau do loads of research papers in general. So research.tableau.com is full of papers around visualization, around storytelling or, or around color choice as well. And Maureen herself has written loads of fantastic papers, but also the likes of Jock McKinley and Robert Corsaro, who just do amazing stuff. Even if you take one or two nuggets from a skim read of those papers, I think that really helps become a better practitioner. And I also think that uh, Hadley Wickham, uh, the, one of the creators of R Studio and R, I believe, um, he he does loads of this stuff as well. I think one of his one of the favorite uh, one of my favorite papers and talks he's given is about thinking about the data structure. And I'll, I'll send send a link to add on the show notes. Um, and basically talks about before you start doing anything, you have to get your data right. And uh, he he talks about the tidyverse, which is a way uh, a, a series of packages that in R that allow you to clean up data in, in a certain way. I'm not an R practitioner, so I can't speak with intelligence about it. Um, but the, the the paper and the talk that Hadley's written about uh, and talks about is really, really good. Just just while we're on Hadley Wickham, on the, on the Hadley Wickham <laughs> point, he's he's got a really nice... Um, he started doing this almost like... A, we talked about Twitch last time, right? He's yeah. He did a um, almost like a Twitch cast of him using our studio to build and solve a problem. Like he, you sit there <laughs> and he commentates... Cast. Um, about oh, him in our studio writing some script and what he's doing as he goes along with it, which is which is fascinating. I, I found it, 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 it really, really good to see someone not only iterate in a different tool, but also commentate about what he's doing and why he's doing it and the sort of why he knows to do that versus something else, uh, which is what which loops us back to that learning and then the teaching, right? The, that yeah. teaching reinforces his own thinking of doing something. Good stuff. 
I think we're now on to uh, now what, right? Yeah, exactly. So we're now on to the now what. So we've talked about the actual topic itself. So the sort of discovery, learning and teaching cycle. Um, the, the so what is us mentioning about, you know, all these different caveats to learning in that sort of way. So what's the what's the now what, Tim? What what is our um, nugget of information information we want our listeners to take away? So I I think I think I, I'd pitch it at different people. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take shots at the people who actually build these softwares and technologies in the first place because I think mm-hmm. sometimes they get carried away with innovation and they forget they forget new users. Um, and I'm hypercritical in this sense, so I, I, might, I might sound sensational here. But I don't think enough tools do a good job of thinking about the onboarding experience. I think um, I, I think after the Austin conference almost two years ago now, I, I, I waxed on about it for a whole year. I was, I was criticizing Tableau a lot because their onboarding experience it, it isn't, isn't great for, for a newbie. And I know everyone in the community knows people, so, you know, if you're in the community, then great. You have someone to hold your hand. There are lots of blogs. But if imagine you have no internet. Someone's installed Tableau on your machine and you need to open it. And there's actually, in the in the design community for apps, there's actually a really brutal website. I'll have to find it and put it in the, in the show notes. But what they do is they take an application, they kill the internet, and then they try and mm-hmm. use it. And... <laughs> uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the feedback is so brutal. Uh, you have you have such great feedback from very honest designers, and it's all about user experience. But you know, if I gave if I gave a tool I use every day, like Tableau, to my grandma, I kill the internet, and said to her, "Okay, here you go. Um, uh, you know your finances in Excel. Uh, visualize them. How far could they get to actually even just opening the software? And for Tableau, there's so many steps. Actually, there's so many steps." Um, so one thing I'd love Tableau to do is to think about um, progressive disclosure in their software so that when I'm trying to do something that is hinting that I don't understand something, I'd love to see a little tooltip that says, hey, are you trying to do this? A bit like Clippy in Microsoft Word. Clippy. Everyone oh. loved Clippy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was annoying as hell, but actually that is exactly the kind of almost, uh, uh, someone's going to call it an AI, and it's not an AI. It's just... It's just some logic, right? It's a bot. But it's a bot. <laughs> it's a bot. It's a bot that's just, you know, watching your behavior. And when you try and do something repeatedly and it knows, okay, this sort of behavior means you're trying to actually do X, then I think that would be a really, really cool um, thing to do. I'm, I'm half working on like a concept video to try and show this um, a little Re-imagine bit Reimagine Reimagining Tableau. Than... Exactly, exactly. Um but there's so many other problems that you need to be solved before that. I know this is not like a super important thing. Tutorials are great. Everything is out there. I just think at the point of use, we'll take something like level of detail calculation. How on earth is someone supposed to know that A, that phrase exists, B, what that means, and C, search for it? If, they've, if they don't have someone on their shoulder to tell them what it is, like you're mm-hmm. trying to do this thing in Tableau, how would you know if you didn't have internet to go search for that phrase? Like, even if you had the internet, how would you know to type that? There's, there's nothing in the software to tell you, right? I, I'd actually say one of the most frustrating things about a new, a fresh install of Tableau is when you open the calculations window, once you get that, once you get to the stage of opening a calculations window. <laughs> right click, um, scroll down, edit. Yeah, exactly. Or, or go to, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 I did a blog about the seven different ways of creating a calculation. But one of, when that window pops up, um, the the right hand pane that that pops out yeah. uh, when you click that little arrow that should be there by default i don't understand yeah. why it's not there by default like the amount of times yeah. i've gone into uh i've sat next to a new user who's just installed tableau and uh i've said okay go to calculation field one of the things we're going to do set up straight away is the fact that you click this button so you actually can see the different formulas you can use yeah um and it will be handy for you to know to do that um, I, sp- I spoke to some devs at, at conference about this exact thing. They're like, mm, "Yeah, that's a good idea," um, sort of thing. But um, no, like, I, I, no, it's I, really I, important. I, yeah, no, <laughs> I, I do agree. I do agree. Um, so I guess what we're my my question to you then is, what is a tool that has a really good um, onboarding sort of experience? I guess Alteryx has that getting started window that pops up and has all those tutorials we can do, uh, which is kind of handy that that is handy but it's it's invasive because it's shoved in your face <laughs> yeah, okay. right 
And what do you do when mm-hmm. something's shoved in your face? You close you it straight away. It. So it's yeah. about, uh, and again, you know, the credit to Autrix for actually developing really good tutorial content because I think theirs is, is some of the best I've come across. Um, mm-hmm. But that said, because it's shoved in front of you, um, you're even more desensitized to it. It's like w- when you get used to seeing adverts on the internet, your eyes just get really good at ignoring them, right? Um, and it's mm-hmm. the same sort of, it suffers from that problem. What I'd love is as I'm dragging something onto the tool pane and I'm struggling to do something or I'm struggling with a calculation, I'd love it just to pop up and say, hey, I noticed you're struggling with X. Are you trying to do this? Oh, here's some help tutorials on how to do X, you know? It's that sort of progressive disclosure. And so here's, here's a, like an ideal world, okay? So you're probably thinking, what do you actually mean with this idea? So I'm going to run really quickly with this idea. Number one, <laughs> you need some sort of user profile setup. Adobe has this. Uh, it synchronizes through all your software. So when you open Adobe and you've never been on the machine before, you log in, boom, all your settings are there. So you need in a way of storing all this information Perfect. so you know what a user has and hasn't done before. Number two, you need to learn what the user is doing, okay? And typically that means the cloud. So you have to store this information somewhere in the cloud so the profile synchronizes across all the machines. Number three, uh, you start to score a user based on what they are using and what they're not. So as they use the tool over time, you start to notice that they haven't used a certain set of tools or they have, and you start almost creating a, a progression um, status. So you say, ah, you've used 60% of the tools available in Tableau or the tools available in Nortrix or the tools are, and packages available in R. And you're tracking this over time. And then at periodic moments, you surface that to the user and say, hey, we've noticed you've been using Tableau for three months and you haven't created a calculation. Maybe you should uh, go watch this video written by Ravi, you know, on the information lab blog post. And that's the whole point. It's not about creating the content. It's about linking the user to the content at the time of most need. And that time of most need is really hard to do if you don't have those steps uh, previously. Yeah, 100%. And I also feel like, so I'm, I'm more all about the sort of corporate strategy side of things in a lot of these things, because I'm like, on one hand, I'm like, self-service is a fantastic thing. On the other hand, you're sort of stuck with this yeah, but you want to lock down certain things because that's how companies kind of work. But anyway, um, the, my, my sort of view with that is it would be great if when someone logged in, it was connected to the Active Directory. Or say you were able to import the company's custom color palettes. You'd be able to give them stencils and um, formats of all the different fonts they, that the company uses. And all they th- these things are built in. as well as As well as a link to content which... The person who's rolled out the desktops or the server can say, okay, I want the user to be able to see <clears throat> these videos. I want them to be able to see this video, this video, this video, this video, these contents. Or I want the t- Tableau to pop up regularly with the getting started pack. So the, the Tableau have two different different really good uh, sections for you to get started. Firstly is all those, the suite of videos that we know and love. Uh, and also there's a, um, a pack which is getting started um, day by day. It's like a training pack sort of thing where you watch some things, you do some things, you read some white papers, etc. And that's a really good structured way of learning it, but it's not enforced enough. It's not shared enough, in my opinion, at least. Yeah. Um, so how, how would you... Let's, so we talked about that sort of initial learning stage. Uh, what about... I guess that ties into discovery as well. So what's our now what for teaching? <sighs> It's really so tough I guess one. it because in in our sort of realm of space as consultants, it's fairly easy to tick that box because when you go out to consult, you have to know something to explain to a client about how they're teaching something, or you have to teach them something, mm-hmm. and you know that's easier to do in this space than it is for say uh, Joe Blogs at X Corp who is working in finance but loves Tableau and there's no center of excellence setup. Yeah, and yeah, I agree. I, I sort of think with teaching, I'm going to say something uh, a little bit harsh, but less spoon feeding. I'd love, I'd mm-hmm. love there to be less. This is exactly how to do that end to end solutionizing, and more of you know getting people to actually you know go through um, the process of learning how to do things because. That's the problem with having a great community. There's so many blog posts on exactly how to do X. And a lot of people, at the time of need, they just blast through uh, that like a mm. task list. 
and they just do A, B, C, D, and they're done. And they send off their report, and they're done. They don't look at it again. What they missed is why that particular process is maybe better than three other blogs that have done something similar but have achieved it in a different way, right? Okay, I guess that that sort of comes back to um, the, the, there's that there was that great image during the rounds on Twitter recently, or at least before Christmas, which was how do I code? I just take someone else's and tweak bits till it works for my data set, which is basically yeah. what you're doing for a tutorial, right? Where it's a step by step recipe, you know, because a lot of tutorials. I mean, I've done this. I like when I first started blogging, I just did step by step, do this, do this, do this, without having that descriptive explainer of what's happening and why it's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the other the other element of that is that um, uh, I also wish um, that people uh, promoted other people's content more rather than recreating solutions that have already been, you know, talked about in the community. Um, mm-hmm. I'll give a shout out to, to Kurt Harris, actually, because he does this really, really well. Whenever anyone uh, creates a blog about something that's been done in a different way, he always goes out of his way to highlight the other the other perspective, and he doesn't mm-hmm. he, he doesn't do another blog. He, he just says, "Hey, this is this blog over here." And I think something that we all very guilty of, and I certainly realized the amount of stuff I blog just fell through the floor when what I what I did when I had a blog idea is instead of just writing it, I actually just googled and saw. Are there any other blogs out there? Yes. Do they answer the question well enough? Yes. Um, can I offer an alternative perspective? And quite a lot, the answer was no. And so I just didn't write mm. the blog. <laughs> and um, what I didn't do then is, you know, showcase those blog and say, oh, this has really helped me out. But I'm starting to do improve which is, that. Which is the step think, five, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I think I wish I wish more people would do that or even build on other people's blogs. I'd love to see more examples of, hey, um, you know, this person has done this great blog. Uh, I'm going to follow on from that and I'm going to add this, this and this to it, you know? So actual mm-hmm. community building where we're building on each other's solutions and going out of our way to look for things that have already been done and adding to it because it, it mm-hmm. can create noise in a, in a world where everyone's trying to sort of, you know, add something and create noise when you start to search for stuff and you've got, you know, 15 hits on Google. You always hit the top one. But yeah perspective is really important and actually if you could create this sort of neural network of community posts that sort of come together to enhance everyone's understanding then that would be amazing cool yeah no um i mean this is a topic that i think we when we were sort of circulating the ideas that we could talk about this was like one of the really meaty ones because we can literally yeah. just ca- carry on talking about it on for and an off. hour yeah um, i think we did for, yeah for an hour <laughs> Yeah, I think it was uh, it was a solid uh, 50, 60 minutes. So, Absolutely. Um, but cool. still lovely. I think we've rounded the, the topic off well. Um, we'd love to know mm-hmm. your feedback. This is still our second episode, so um, we'd love to have your feedback on the show. Um, forgot to top and tail the show, actually, and say that this was a, a data and tech podcast um, at the very beginning. So in case you're wondering, if you've made it this far, <laughs> and clearly you're into the content. Um, yeah. But uh, that, that's what we're about. And um, give us some feedback online um, about the show, Twitter. Mm-hmm. You can get in yeah. touch uh, with us directly. Um, just DM us. You can find us on all major platforms. And um, yeah, I think we'll, we'll do our next show probably in, in early February. Yeah, early February, I think. Yeah, so I, th- I think we've got some really good feedback after the first one, uh, especially on Twitter and, and, and such. So, uh, yeah, keep that coming in. I think one of the things I, um, one of the really, w- one of the good ideas I had was having a ding at each stage. Mm-hmm. Um, let us know if that's something that you think would be useful for this sort of thing, given that is we're trying to at least keep it to some structure, whether the ding would be helpful as a audio cue. You know what, Ravi? I'm going to go one step better. I'm going to add it to this episode. So, okay. Tell us whether the ding worked in this episode or not for each stage. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> the cool. powers of post processing. <laughs> exactly. Cool. All right. Thanks for the call, man. Nice one. No worries. And take it easy. And I'll see you probably next see. week sometime. Absolutely.